Hey everybody, it's Cam here. Today I'm going to talk about Plague of Giants by Kevin Hearn. Uh, I recently finished the entire series off. This is actually my second read of Plague of Giants as well. And uh, if you are so interested, there is a podcast episode that we did uh, way back in 2017 that also talks about this. It includes my wife and uh, my old podcast co-host Chris as well. Um, sometimes when I'm doing these reviews, I struggle to figure out exactly how I'm going to talk about a book, especially if you know it's more character driven and the world building's not like the real big part. But with this book, I'm going to struggle to keep my world building enthusiasm constrained. I'm going to try to make sure this isn't like a, a 30 minute long episode because if uh, if I just had my my way and I was just going to keep talking and, and, and didn't realize people were going to get tired of listening to me, I could talk about this book for hours. Uh, I recently actually read all three of them in a row. Uh, I, I had to go back and sit down to make sure that everything I was going to talk about uh, was contained in the first book so there aren't spoilers and so that uh, I'm not you know giving out things that shouldn't be given out. I think I've done a pretty good job of that. So uh, let's go ahead and get started on talking about the book. I'll give you all the details. We'll read the book blurb like usual, and then I'll get into the world building and magic and all that fun stuff. Uh, the book, once again, was published in 2017. It is 624 pages long. It is the first book in the now-completed Seven Kennings trilogy. One other thing to note, too, the second book in the series... Uh, a Blight of Black Wings might actually be my favorite book to in any series ever. So obviously I'm a big fan of uh, these books. Let's read that blurb. Mother and Warrior. Taland is a soldier who has already survived her toughest battle, losing her husband. But now she finds herself on the front lines of an invasion of giants, intent on wiping out the entire kingdom including Talon's two sons, all that she has left. The stakes have never been higher. If Talon fails, her boys may never become men. Durvin is a historian who longs for a simple, quiet life, but he's drawn into intrigue when he's hired to record the tales of a mysterious bard who may be a spy or even an assassin for a rival kingdom. As the bard shares his fantastical stories, Durvin makes a shocking discovery. He may have a connection to the tales, one that will bring his own secrets to light. Rebel and Hero Abby's family have always been hunters, but Abby wants to choose a different life for himself. Embarking on a journey of self-discovery, Abby soon learns that his destiny is far greater than imagined. A powerful new magic thrust upon him may hold the key to defeating the giants once and for all, if it doesn't destroy him first. Set in a magical world of terror and wonder, this novel is a deeply felt epic of courage and war, in which the fates of these characters intertwine, and where ordinary people become heroes, and their lives become legend. Um, real quick, I'm just going to note that um, Abby is my absolute favorite character in the series, but I'm not going to talk any more about him. Uh, the, the part that's in the book blurb doesn't take place until almost halfway into the book, and I kind of feel like it would be a spoiler, and it's something that I found super cool. It was one of my absolute favorite chapters in the entire book so i'm gonna uh, not talk about that and just recommend you know that, that when you read the book you uh um, you see for yourself and if you happen to to read this because you saw this uh episode or or if you're watching this episode because you've already read the book uh, in the comments let me know what you thought of abby okay um we're going to start off uh, doing, you know, my traditional, we'll talk about the world, uh, the magic, then the plot. Uh, that won't take too much of my time in this. Uh, I think the world building part is what I'm going to focus on for this episode. Then I'll talk about some of the important people, uh, the bad, the good, and my final thoughts. So, okay, the way that I'm going to start this whole world building and magic system part is I'm going to explain the magic system real quick, and then I'll talk about each of the, the countries and how, uh, what magical kenning they have, and how that um, basically shapes their entire uh, civilization. So um, there are, when we start the book off, there's five kennings. Uh, obviously, there's going to be a couple more as we move on, since the book is called The Seven Kennings. But we uh, have, the way that you get your magic is you basically have to be willing to commit suicide. 
which does lead to some funny, uh, you know, people who will end up having a Kenning. So um, an example is in the far north is Brinlin. Their uh, magical Kenning is water. And in order to, uh, to get your Kenning and be blessed by your god, Brent, uh, you have to jump into basically this big like water flume. And you jump in and you try to swim to the other end. Uh, it's too far to swim and you're going to drown unless you're blessed. So pretty quickly you're going to discover that uh, you either drown or if you suddenly can breathe underwater, well then you got a magical ability. But it's only about a 50-50 shot in this case. Uh, there's a couple of the kennings uh, that are higher than that, and there's going to end up being one kenning where the uh, survival rate's like 12%. So, you know, there's a good chance you're going to die uh, instead of being blessed. And then, once you have your magical ability, uh, using your magical ability uh, too much and too powerfully actually ages you in uh, in some cases. And in, in there's a couple of cases that I'll talk about briefly where, I mean, it's as little as like using your magical ability for one minute basically ages you for a year. Or uh, there's going to be one that I'll talk about with a Fornish where their, their people, their blessing basically makes them like, they look like thorny, they're called thorn hands, and using their magical ability kills them. So it, this is a case where if you want your magic to... Uh, to mean something and have consequences, then you're absolutely going to love this series. Uh, so let's go ahead and talk about each of the um, the places real quick, and then we'll uh, get into like the plot and all that stuff. So we're going to start off in the north. The graphic should be up uh, showing the map. Uh, to the north is Brindlin. As I mentioned, their kenning is water. Uh, they'll jump into that flume if they get it. Uh, they're like top two tiers of people are actually like the most uh, deadly in the entire world. Uh, they have, they're called rapids and tidal mariners. Tidal mariners are like the highest you know level, and they can even move like currents around. Uh, one of their their uh, like classifications, I guess, if you think of it in like a magical D and D type setting, is uh, hygienists. So they can actually clean wounds and clean impurities in water. Um, a tidal mariner. The tidal mariners can actually move ocean currents, so they'll move nutrients around. Uh, they're on the coast, you know, so they're going to have uh, uh, good fishing, and, and that's going to be their entire civilization based around that. Below Brinlin on that map, you're going to see Rail on one side and uh, Garana Nent on the other side. Uh, Rail has, they have affinity with stone. So, like, their highest level person is going to be called a Juggernaut. And the juggernauts, like if using their ability, they basically turn into a giant, a stone giant. And so, uh, but the problem is, is for them using that ability ages you for like a year, a minute. Then they have some, a, a couple of different, a, a really cool one. Uh, stone cutters can make roads and build walls and buildings. They build a tunnel. Um, theirs seems to be like, as long as you don't uh, strain yourself, they're like really, really effective. Kind of like the the uh, um, hygienists in Brent. Um, and then they have another one called the Bard. The Bard is going to be the person uh, telling the whole story. And it's one that I, you kind of might think of like, why would a Bard be stone? But stone has memory, and that's kind of how that's explained in this one. Uh, Garana Nent is off on the other side, and they are the one nation of the, you know, the main key people that don't have a kenning to start the series off. Uh, it's a really big deal. It shapes their entire civilization not having magic. Because in Garana Nant, there are just basically every animal there is, think of them as like on steroids and dangerous. And just leaving your walled city without an army behind you is a good way to get yourself eaten. Because of this, uh, the army and the nobility really uh, um, tread on the, uh, the lower class and uh, just treat people poorly. There's a lot more inequality in Grana Nent than there is anywhere else when we start off with. Down uh, farther to the south, you're going to see Forn. Uh, the Fornish are actually the only uh, of these groups so far that I've talked about that are light-skinned. They're very short. They're like four to five feet tall. They live in a giant like forest under the tree canopy. Their god, the first god, the first tree, is actually like people to get their uh, kenning will go to the tree, the tree will suck you in and either uh, spit you out with a canning or you know use your body as fertilizer. So they have some really cool ones. Uh, mostly they're based on like being able to, uh, to grow plants and things like that. 
Uh, they're, they also have one though called the thorn hand. You come out and your entire body is like covered in thorns. And to really use your power, it basically kills you uh, there. It's a way that they fight against the uh, Hothrim, who are down on one side. They're giants, the Hothrim. They're also pale skinned. Think like Vikings is kind of how I thought of their entire civilization. Uh, they have the fire kenning. They are terrifying to everybody else because they're like 12 to 14 feet tall and they can burn you. Their highest uh, level person called a Fury can actually turn themselves basically into a fire tornado. And like at will, those people can just like light things on fire. Uh, their, you know, highest classification, like or not their lower classification that's the most common. They can, uh, they, are, they make really good blacksmiths. They can, uh, you know, make cool glass work as well because they can uh, um, regulate flames and things like that. Uh, theirs probably is the scariest one to me, but I guess it is a quick uh, death if you don't end up uh, succeeding in getting a cannon. You have to jump into a volcano. So you're either quickly burned up or you are from there on out immune to fire. Uh, the last one that I'll talk about real quick is the Karians. They are a pacifist society. Wind is the, uh, the ability that they have. Their um, like highest classification person can actually turn themselves into the wind and they can actually move people around. Um, if they don't use it too long, then it's a really effective way to, you know, to move things and to go. But if you, you, you know, use it for too long, especially like out over water or something, then uh, it'll age you as well. Uh, super cool. All these kennings are awesome. And like I said, they just shape the entire civilization around them because of how different they are. So like the Raelic, they're going to, you know, they're going to build everything in stone. Uh, the Fornish are going to live in the forest. The Brents to the north, they're going to have mostly coastal and river uh, cities, right? So it, it's just really cool to me how the entire magic system shapes the entire world. It, this is definitely not a case of where you have magicians just running around, you know, doing their thing, but most people are uh, not, not affected by magic, right? Let's real quick talk about the plot. According to uh, my quick look at my timer, I am already running really long, so we're going to go... Uh, real quick on the plot. First book, we start off with two giant invasions. The Hathrim, they have a uh, volcano that erupts, destroys their city. Luckily, the Gorn Mogan, their, the leader, uh, the Hearthfire is what they call their leader, of one of these cities is prepared for this, and he sails up real quick and invades Grana Nent. They don't have a magical ability right, so he figures that's a good thing to do. So, on the one hand, you're going to have the uh, normal sized people that are going to have to deal with an invasion from the Huthrim. The Fornish especially hate the Huthrim because uh, they're always trying to steal timber. And uh, so the Huthrim and, and so the Fornish and Garona Nent are going to have to deal with that giant invasion. On the other side, we have a second giant invasion. Uh, they call them the Bone Giants. They are mysterious. It, to, to start off this whole series, we have no idea where the Bone Giants came from or why they're invading but they do a pretty good job before the story even actually starts they've wiped out a whole bunch of uh, the um, brent cities they almost wiped out all of them and if it weren't for that talent who we uh, mentioned in the book blurb they would have probably wiped out even the capital but those tidal mariners um, are able to like she can um, she basically wipes out an entire invasion fleet just with her magical ability it also ages her a lot though so she goes from being like late 20s to looking like she's in her 50s and that's kind of one of those threads that goes along the whole time too of like her using her power we've already mentioned in the in the blurb as well that her husband has died before the series starts and so she has two young children like nine and twelve i think are their ages or somewhere like that and she's always worried that right her children are going to grow up as orphans but her power was necessary to save, you know, all of Brent. So the, um, the way that the story um, unfolds really does make you care about the people. And you know that, that even you, that any sort of, you know, big magical uh, ability is going to have consequences. And since you care about so many of the characters, it really is, um, you know, there's, there's consequences and it does make you uh, feel for characters, right? Um, the way the story is all told, um, it mentions Durvin. He is the, like a chronicler for a bard named Fenton, who will actually be able to, through his magical ability, um, 
make himself look like and sound like the people who he's telling their story. So the way the whole thing is, is that we've got a whole bunch of people to start off with. They're just waiting for a relief armies to show up in Pelamen, which is the capital of Brint. And so there's just thousands and thousands of refugees in a city. Or there's thousands and thousands of refugees out in a field in fr- around the capital. And he is has been sent there to try to basically um, sound or basically tell people a tale and let everyone know what has happened throughout the entire world. And so he's going to talk for about 50 days in the end between the three books, and he's going to tell the entire tale of the invasion, the important people and what they did. And then, um, you know, we'll get up to to that point where uh, the relief force in book three shows up. So, um, the whole thing is, it's going to have that, that past, you know, it's being told in the past and then we're going to have, you know, that relationship with Durvin and Finton. And then, um, you know, there's a bunch of different characters. And what I really like about this, too, is that most of the important characters, they're not like the nobility. We're not talking about like a chosen one or, you know, a general or like the, the, the king or whatever, right, as being the most important person. For the most, for the most part the uh, people that that save people or that do the momentous um, actions, right? They are just your average everyday person who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And I think that makes me care about the characters more as well because of that, right? It's not like uh, you had some person who was foretold for thousands of years to be uh, the chosen one savior. Um, I will mention one other thing that uh, I do love how many... Uh, I really do like a lot of the characters. Um, Abby, who's mentioned, uh, Talend, she's um, you know a great character as well. And then one other big thing that's important to note too is that while I wouldn't uh, call uh, Kevin Hearn um, George R.R. R. Martin or anything when it comes to killing off characters, uh, there are going to be character deaths and important characters, ones that maybe you like, are going to die as well. Uh, he's not going to kill off everyone, obviously. But it is something that, you know, adds a little bit of an extra element of importance to that. So in terms of important peeps, I think I've talked about um, them enough, Finton and Durvin. Um, I think my favorite in, um, character is actually a mix between Abi and Gondal uh, is his name. He's a scholar, like a language scholar, and he's going to play an important role in helping uh, people figure out um, who the, the bone giants are and kind of like figure out why they invaded and stuff like that. Uh, he's really funny because he's like your typical absent-minded scholar. He always has mustard stains on him and uh, just kind of looks like a slob. At one point, I think this is actually later on, but they'll describe him where he tried to eat something, but he's looking at his notes and he actually hits himself in the face with uh, the the food instead. And then he looks at it like the food was the, 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 one, the offending party. So he's just a great character. Let's go ahead and talk about the uh, bad, the good, and... Uh, my final thoughts then so that uh, I don't let's let this go to 30 minutes or more. Uh, the bad. There's really only one thing that I'm going to say is the bad. There are so many characters. And because they're all being told, you know, with by the bard Finton, and then the narrator is Durvin, um, oftentimes, even to this point where I've read the whole series and I've read Plague of Giants itself twice now, I still couldn't tell you the names of, of like more than four or five people. Um I know what they did if you describe them and talk about them, right? Because everything is really super awesome, and and I really love the book. But the thing is, is that because of the way the story is being told, and there being such different names for everyone, I really struggled to remember a lot of people's names. And um, if that's something that's important, then I guess that's a bad thing. But for me, it didn't really matter. I knew who they were and what they were doing, and I wasn't like confused by like what one character did versus another. It's not a case of where like in Wheel of Time or Malazan, there's some characters that have really close names, and so sometimes you forget what they're doing. In this case, uh, they're all doing very different things, so that wasn't an issue for me. Um, in terms of the good, I really like that storytelling style, despite me uh, not remembering characters' names very frequently. Uh, you are going to be hard pressed to ever find a cooler world building. Uh, slash magic system where every bit of it um, impacts just how civilizations are built and for there to be you know five completely different ones to start the series off that um, make each of the uh, civilizations completely unique even Garonanet not having a, a magical affinity right uh, is a makes a big difference because uh, the way their civilization is very unequal um, as a you know 
plays a large role in not having magic and them being forced to to rely on the king and whoever is ruling in the city for protection, even just to leave your walls, right? So it's a big deal. Um, magic system is awesome. Uh, I love that the magic, you know, has consequences. Uh, it leads to some really cool uh, different people too, right? Um, in some cases, uh, especially uh, in in some of the places that, that get largely wiped out, they're going to have a lot of like people who are, um, you know, trying to get their kenning because their family died and they don't really care whether they live or die. So that's going to lead to some, um, some, you know, weird consequences as well because of that. Uh, just the world building is top notch, every bit of it. I really like in this case too, I consider the good that this is like a true epic fantasy. You know, this is a meaty book for me. Sometimes, um, I like a short, cozy read, but I like my, um, epic fantasies to be longer. This one's like six, 700 pages and all of the books are going to be in that range. So we're not talking like a 1200 page book, but we're also not talking about a 300 page book. And I think that because of the way the magic system works in this, like that's a really good number for me. Um, and just in general, I feel like the character building is really awesome in this book as well. That's just another huge positive for me. And, and because of the number of characters and the depth of, of you know, character building, you're going to have you're going to have gay characters, you're going to have straight characters, you're going to have women, you're going to have men, you'll have young people and old people. Basically, there is going to be a character for you in this book. Now, my final thoughts. Um, really, I just loved the entire series. I love this book. Um, book two is my favorite book two in any series, I believe. Um, and if not, then I'd have to really go back and think real hard to figure out one that would be instead. Um, book one, you know, has to set things up and book three, I think I would give it a nine out of 10 instead of a 10 out of 10. Like I give the other two, because I think it does wind things down a little bit sooner than I would like and get into that whole, uh, you know, telling us the history and, and why all these things happened. But book two, um, is just perfect. There is nothing but action. And because the stories are intertwined, you know, the whole way, this is a true epic fantasy where you can't read book one or you can't read just book two or book three and know what's going on. Uh, that's something that I feel like happens more and more now. And I don't know if that's something because people, because uh, authors are worried about whether they're going to, um, you know, have a book read out of order or something, or maybe because I read mostly indie stuff and, you know, as a consequence, people are worried they don't want someone to buy a book two and then not know what's going on. Um, this is maybe one of the the, the rare cases where um, I, it is more positive to be part of one of the big publishers is that if your whole three book series is bought from the beginning, then you know that, you know, you're going to have, you'll be able to have each of your plot points set out. Um, but I really like how, I mean, I just felt like book two, since um, the way the story is being told, it's just, it's perfect to me. I don't think that Kevin Hearn could have written a better book two. Uh, book one is awesome as well. I'm not saying that I don't think it is also uh, perfect, but it does require, you know, setting up characters, us learning the magic system and all of that stuff. So it takes a little bit, you know, to get into just because it's an epic fantasy. Um, can't recommend the series enough. Huge fan. Uh, loved every moment of my reading. And another thing, this is a series that my wife has now read twice. Uh, Chris, uh, who used to do the podcast with me, he's read the whole series twice now as well. And I've read book one twice. So this is something I feel like does have good uh, reread value as well because of um, how cool the magic system is and, and the world building, right? This is one of those where you're going to find new little things that you maybe you missed um, every time you go back and read it. So if, if rereadability is uh, something that, that matters, that's a big perk too. Um, obviously, I'm giving this book a 10 out of 10. I'm giving the entire series a 10 out of 10, and um, I can't recommend it enough. I hope you all have a wonderful end to your year. This will um, be my second to last new book um, review of the year. I do have one, maybe two Spiffbo reviews. I'm still trying to figure out how I'm going to review one of the books that was very short, um, but I will get The Last Fang of God out here pretty quickly. I uh, hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, and thank you for watching.